All right, I guess we're on. Cool. Uh, I never had a video before my talk, so that was kind of unique. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Meta Tamela, as I said in my video. Uh, I come from London. I work at Google. And today I'm going to be talking about Istio, which is a framework um, to manage and secure my services. Um, before my talk, I want to let you know that you are all special because this is the first time I'm giving a talk in Lithuania and first time in Vilnius. Uh, so I will always remember this conference as the first one that enabled me to come here. So thanks for that. Um, I, po I will post my slides on my Twitter. So that's my Twitter account. So if you want the slides, you don't have to take pictures. Just follow me there and I'll post the link after the talk today sometime, okay? So what's our agenda today? Um, first of all, I'm going to start with explaining the need for Istio. Um, because, you know, in technology, there's lots of frameworks, there's lots of things out there, and we need to pick and choose what we learn because we, can't, we cannot learn everything. So I just want to provide the motivation for Istio. Um, so that means we're going to talk about containers a little bit, we're going to talk about Kubernetes a little bit, and then we're going to talk about, talk about Istio and, and why it exists so that it's all clear to us. After that, we will talk about what is Istio at the very, very high level. So what are the design goals for Istio? And how do you actually uh, get started with Istio? Then we'll get into details of Istio, the building blocks. So in Istio, there's MOI proxies, there's mixers and pilots and Istio auth, and we'll just go through them quickly, um, see what, what kind of stuff they do. Uh, and the greatest thing about Istio for me is that it's very pluggable. So you can actually use the things that Istio provides, but if you want to use something else for logging or for tracing, you can actually plug them in. And there's lots of add-ons for that. Uh, so we're going to go through some of the add-ons like Grafana, Prometheus, Zipkin, Service Graph, and see how you install them and see what you get out of the box, uh, just to give you an idea. And then finally, um, another great thing about Istio is that you can change traffic rules in Istio. So you can basically define which microservice talks to what microservice, um, and what are the rules between them, and then you can do um, um, traffic splitting, you, you, you can do fault injection, all those cool things. Um, and you can do all of this dynamically. So I just want to show you an example of that, all right? So before I start, I'm curious, who is here running um, production code in containers, in Docker today? Okay, a few people. And who, who are using some kind of container management platform like Kubernetes, Mesos, things like that? Okay, fewer people. And who has, who has used or heard of Istio? A couple of people. Okay, cool. I, I always want to get an idea of like how, how people are um, in terms of the landscape. And anyone running stuff in the cloud, AWS, Azure, cloud, a few people. Okay, cool. So the need for Istio. So I'm just going to go through this quickly uh, just to provide the motivation for why Istio exists so everyone is on the same page. So when you think about solving a problem with software, uh, what do you need? Um, the first thing that you need is the actual code that solves the problem. And I, I'm assuming that most of you are developers, so you know what, the, what this means. Um, but that's not the only thing you need, right? I mean, code is the fun, fun part, and code is the one that's actually solving the problem. But then you need to make the code production ready. Uh, by pro production readiness, I mean that you know, once the code is running and something goes wrong, can you trace it? Can you look at the logs? Can you change the load balancing rules? So all the things around the code that makes code uh, maintainable, right? And sometimes um, the actual code, the time it takes to write the code, is less than the time it takes to make it production ready. So it's not trivial, and it's not something you can forget about, right? You, it, we need to do these things, otherwise our code will be not maintainable. And then after that, you need a way for your code, um, for, for you to package and run your code consistently. Because usually you don't ru uh, run your code on a single machine, um, and you don't run it on a single kind of environment. Uh, so you need a way to package it up in a way that can run anywhere in any kind of environment nowadays. And finally, uh, once you deploy your code, uh, you need to, first of all, deploy it, uh, and hopefully in an optimal way. So you're given your resources, you need to be able to figure it out where you should deploy it. And once it's deployed, you need to make sure it's running, right? So if, if your code goes down, someone has to take a look at that and create maybe new instance of your app and make it run. So there's a lot of things that you need to do. It's not just about writing your code anymore. Um, and in terms of who does these, like writing the code is your responsibility. Um, 
we have AI coming up and maybe we will have AI writing our code at some point, but as of today, you have to write the code. Um, in terms of packaging and running your code um, consistently, that's what containers and Docker is about, right? In Docker, you, and we'll talk about this briefly, um, it's basically a common way of packaging your application and running it consistently, no matter where, where it is. And then once your code is running, uh, you want to manage it and make sure that things are working. So that's what Kubernetes and other container management platforms are for. And Istio is, in my mind, it's more about making your code production ready. So all the things that you need to do to get your code to the production quality, Istio helps for that, okay? So that's where the landscape is. So containers help you to package it. Kubernetes makes sure that your container is running, but Istio makes your code production ready. And what is a container? I'm, I know most people know, but just to cover this, basically a container, it's a way to virtualize your application in a lightweight way. Uh, so before we used to have virtual machines um, and then we would install the operating system on the virtual machine, then we will install all the, all the uh, dependencies of our application and then our application, and then we would just run the virtual machine. That worked, but it wasn't lightweight. These virtual machines, they're not so easy to create and run. But containers are much more smaller than virtual machines, and then there's this notion of images that you can layer and depend on. Um, and then you can have multiple containers running on a single VM. So this way you can have like five, six different containers running on a virtual machine. They're much more lightweight than a virtual machine. And then Docker basically made the notion of containers popular among developers. Um, I think the greatest thing that Docker provides is what's called Dockerfile. In Dockerfile, you basically define your um, dependency of your application, you define the environment your application needs, and you also define how your application runs. Um, and then once you have this Docker file, you pass it to Docker, and, and Docker, no matter where it is, it will make sure that this environment that your application needs is consistent, and it's, it runs it in a consistent way. So for example, in this case, we have uh, from Debian latest in the Docker file, so that means we are depending on the latest image from Debian, so that's our dependency. And then we are installing some um, libraries. So in this case, we are installing Nginx. And then we are exposing port 80 because that's what our application needs. And then we are running a command, Nginx command. So we are running Nginx and then we are, we are defining what our application needs in this Docker file and Docker gives us that consistency. But containers by themselves, they're not enough. So when you look at uh, what you need when you run an application, you need a bunch of things. Like for example, um, if you want um, to have multiple copies of your container for redundancy, you need to create those containers and run them yourself. Uh, if you want to have resiliency, make sure that your containers are running, you probably need a health endpoint where, and then someone has to ping that health endpoint and make sure that your container is healthy. And if, if it's not healthy, someone has to start a new one. Uh, if you want to do configuration and secrets, you need to manage them somehow, right? And so there's all these things that you still have to do uh, just because you took your application and containerized it doesn't mean that they go away. It's still your responsibility. So that's why we have things like Kubernetes. Um, so Kubernetes tries to answer these problems. It tries to give you a framework so that you can do these things in a consistent way. Uh, what is Kubernetes? As you see here, it's a Greek word that everyone mispronounces. Um, so the right way of saying Kubernetes is Kubernetes. And the reason why I know this is because I'm originally from Cyprus, and in Cyprus, Greek is one of the languages. Uh, but Kubernetes was born in the US and everyone started mispronouncing it and that's why we're stuck with it now. Um, so it's 100% open source, written in Go. And the idea of Kubernetes is that, you know, instead of worrying about machines and virtual machines, you just say, tell Kubernetes, I, I have a cluster, just, just schedule this container and make sure that it runs. And Kubernetes makes sure that that's the case. It makes sure that your container is scheduled to the right place and it also makes sure that your container is running. So it kind of abstracts away the machines from you. So you're thinking at the application level rather than the machine level. So at the very high level, this is how a Kubernetes cluster looks like. There is a master that manages a cluster and there is nodes where you can run your containers. Um, and as a user, you talk to the master and you tell the master, you know, this is what I want. I want my container to be scheduled and Kubernetes figures out how to do that. But you don't really need to talk to every single machine yourself. And in this Kubernetes, world, a microservice kind of looks like this. So first you have um, your code in a container, 
and that code lives in some kind of public registry, maybe Docker Hub or, or some, um, some other internal um, registry like Google Cloud um, image um, registry. Then from here, you create a, what's called a pod template. So in Kubernetes, a pod is the smallest unit that it schedules. It can be a single container or it can be multiple containers. And then you tell Kubernetes what you want. So in this case, for example, we, there's something called replication control in Kubernetes. You say, I want three replicas. So I want three copies of this container to, to be scheduled and run. And then Kubernetes will look at the nodes that you have in your cluster, and it will find, create these pods, and it will find the right place to schedule these pods. But it's not your problem. It's Kubernetes' problem now. And then once you have your pods, you can label them with different kinds of labels. So here we have a role label that has front end and back end, an environment, production, QA, stuff like that. And once you, your pods are running and you want them to be available to people, you create something called a service in Kubernetes, uh, which has a stable virtual IP. And people from outside, they will get to your service. And then from the service, they will get to your pods running on your nodes. So in this world, uh, a microservice is a combination of your, your code in the container and a combination of what Kubernetes provides with replication controller, watching your pods, and service exposing your pods. And there's many other things. I'm not going, I'm not going through all of it. But you get the idea. So that's, that's what Kubernetes does. But Kubernetes is not enough either, right? Um, so if you want to do logging, you still need to do that. Kubernetes doesn't really give you any framework for logging. If you want to, tr to do tracing, like if you want to trace your HTTP calls, uh, you need to do that. Um, Kubernetes doesn't help with that. Um, if you want to do, let, let's say, uh, dependency visualization, so you have your microservices and they all depend on each other, you want to visualize that. Kubernetes doesn't help for that. And there's all these other things. I'm not going to go through it. But if you want to do um, good DevOps and, and good production level code, you still need to worry about these things. And Docker helps with a little bit. And then Kubernetes helps a little bit, but it's not enough. And that's why we have Istio. This is the logo of Istio. And that's why it exists. So hopefully, this gave you a good overview of why we have Istio and, and why you should care about it. So now, now that we have the motivation for Istio, now let's go through uh, what is Istio at the very high level. Um, so first of all, I think Istio has two high-level goals. The first one is um, whenever you are building microservices, you need to do certain things like logging and tracing, and you need to do, use certain tools. And I don't know about you, but every time I switch jobs, I had to almost relearn these things, because in every different place, they use different tools. And every single time, I have to figure it out how to do it in that place, right? And even in, in the same company, I once switched from one group to another group. And we had two different tracing systems, because one group wanted to use one, and another group wanted to use another one. And I had to actually rewrite a trace um, conversion system so that we can we can take traces from one system to and then output it to another system, which was ridiculous, right? Um, but Istio tries to get away with this problem. It tries to basically um, gather people around common tools and practices. Uh, we all need to do logging. We all need to do tracing. We all need to do all these things. So why don't we pick the best tools and the best practices and, and build a framework around it called Istio, but also make it pluggable so that if you want to do something custom, you can plug it in yourself as well, which is, a, which is a really good goal. It gives you best practices by default, but also it lets you plug in what you have as well. So that's number one. And the second thing is, you know, your application code should solve the business problem and nothing else. It shouldn't know where it's running. It shouldn't know whether it's on Kubernetes or Docker or anything like that, right? But usually, this doesn't happen. Usually, as soon as you start running your code on some kind of framework like Kubernetes, the details of that framework gets into your code somehow. Uh, and that's not good, because if you want to take your code and run it on Mesos or something like that, then you need to worry about those dependencies. Um, but if you rely on Istio, then uh, you don't really need to um, worry about the infrastructure. If Istio gives you what's called proxies that handles all the low-level details so that your application code doesn't have to have um, dependencies on the underlying platform. And we'll see how, how this works in Istio. So uh, to me, these are the two high-level goals for Istio. Um, so Istio means sale, again, in Greek. And this time, it's pronounced correctly, because everyone can say Istio, I guess, correctly. Uh, it's open source, again, like Kubernetes. And its goal is to connect, manage microservices, basically, give you a framework to, to do that. Um, so by default, it, it's built on top of Kubernetes today. 
but it's, it wants to support Mesos and Cloud Foundry and, and more in the future, I'm sure. I'm not sure what the level of support is in Mesos and Cloud Foundry today, but I know that it works on Kubernetes. Um, it provides you metrics, logs, traces, and dependency visualization that we'll take a look at. Uh, it provides identity for your services. So each service gets an identity, and then you can use that identity to check things. So you, want you can do things like, you know, microservice A can call microservice B, but microservice A cannot call microservice C because they each have identity. Um, and it also provides traffic management. So it has features like um, controlling traffic between uh, microservices, um, doing ingress and outgress routing. So you can limit what people call out and you can limit what comes into your cluster, things like that, that we'll take a look. And it also does policy enforcement. So you can set limits between microservices and you can say, this microservice can call that microservice five times a second and no more. And Istio gives you a framework to enforce those limits. All right, so we'll go through these uh, one by one and just look at them in detail. So at the very high level, let's imagine that you have this uh, microservice um, cluster. So you have a front end that the clients talk to. Then you have the front end might be calling an authentication back end that might be talking to some kind of database. Then your front end can be talking to some other microservice called pictures and payments. And then the payments microservice might be talking to another microservice that's external to your um, infrastructure. So let's say you have this. If you want to use Istio in this microservice architecture, then this, this is what you get. So when you install Istio, the first thing that you'll realize is that you, you get an ingress. So ingress is kind of like the gatekeeper to your um, cluster. So all the traffic goes through ingress. And then ingress, um, instead of talking to the front end directly, it will talk to something called proxy. So these proxies, um, they're also called envoys. Um, they're installed as sidecars to your front end. What that means is that your code is running, but then as side to it, there, is a, there will be a proxy that will be running at the same time, and that will be tied to your code. So when front end is created, the proxy gets created, and then when the front end is gone, the proxy goes away as well. And the traffic goes from ingress to the proxy. It doesn't go directly to the front end. And then if front end wants to talk to the pictures, then it will also go through the proxy or the pictures. So uh, all the traffic goes through Istio, basically, through ingress and proxies. And because of that, you get a lot of benefits that I'm going to talk about. So to, um, to install Istio, first you need a cluster. And in this case, I'm running Kubernetes on Google Cloud. So what I need to do is I need to create a Kubernetes cluster. And in, in Google Cloud, you can do that from a gcloud command line tool. So here I'm saying gcloud container clusters create. I give my cluster a name, hello Istio. The only thing I need to do today is enable cluster alpha. So there are some alpha features in, in Kubernetes that enables Istio. So I just make sure that's enabled. But in the future, you probably won't have to do this. And then I specify um, my zone, you're at west. And then this will create my cluster with four nodes. And then I also need to do a role binding. So this creates a role cluster role binding that, in, um, that sets up authentication with Istio, basically. So that's all I need to do. I create my cluster, and I do a like, cluster role binding. And I have a Kubernetes cluster where I can install Istio. Um, you can install Istio on a Kubernetes cluster running on your machine as well, but it will be more complicated because you want yeah, creating a Kubernetes cluster yourself locally. It's a little bit more complicated than just running one command, uh, but it, it is possible. So now, once we have the cluster, I want to show you what it takes to install Istio on top. So let's just take a look at that. So here I am in Google Cloud Console, and let me just play this. So first I'm going to look at the Kubernetes cluster uh, that I have. So as you can see, I, I'm a, I have two clusters, one .NET cluster and one Hello Istio cluster that I just created. Um, and then I have a Cloud Shell. This is a shell in the browser that I can use to manage my cluster, so I'm using that. Um, First, I need to download Istio. So what I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm using curl, and there's a um, get latest Istio command that I can use. Um, and I'm also specifying the version here, uh, because Istio is evolving rapidly. So for this demo, I'm just using Istio 0.4.0. I think this was like two versions before. Uh, now there's 0 0.6 uh, is the latest one. So once I download it, uh, I'm gonna, there's an install folder in Istio for different platforms. Um, so and one of those platforms is Kubernetes, so I'll go there, and there are YAML files that I can run to install Istio. 
and Istio it will install into its own namespace. So if you have Kubernetes already, it won't it won't install into your default namespace. Uh, namespace it will install into a separate Istio namespace. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to export uh, set my path to the Istio's bin folder because Istio has a command line um, tool called Istio CTL. I want to make sure that I have access to that. And once I set my path, I'll just say kubectl apply dash f install Kubernetes. So this is the Kubernetes folder of Istio. And then I'll just say Istio auth. So this will install Istio with mutual authentication enabled between proxies. So now you'll see that it first created an Istio system namespace. That's like this the area where Istio will be installed. And then it will install the all the other components of Istio, the initializer, the pilot and mixer and ingress and all that kind of stuff. And we'll go through these later. I will explain what they are. But basically, we'll just go through it and just install everything in the in the Istio namespace. It won't clutter your existing namespaces, which is nice. So we'll let that happen. Um, once it's happening, we can take a look and make sure that Istio is installed. So this will take like a minute or so. In the meantime, I can take a water break. Yeah, so once this is done, we'll make sure that Istio is running. So this should be done anytime now. Yep. And then we will go and say kubectl. Um, oh, we also want to in, uh, install the initializer. So when my pods are created, when my container is created, I want to make sure that um, the proxy that Istio has is also created automatically. So that's what Istio initializer does. So I am also installing that. And now we are done. So let's just double check that everything works. kubectl get services. And then I'm saying dash n Istio system. That's the namespace where Istio was installed. I can see that there's ingress, mixer, pilot. They're already installed. Uh, the ingress external IP is pending because it's, it's been initialized uh, still. And if I look at the pods, the actual containers that Istio is running, we can see that there's a bunch of pods that are already running. So that's all it takes to install Istio. Once you have the Kubernetes cluster, it's quite easy. All right, let's go back here. Now let's talk about the building block. So what do we install? Um, so there's MY Mixer Pilot and Istio Auth. Um, so it, it kind of looks like this. So let's imagine we have a front end uh, and the payments. Um, the main thing in Istio is what's called proxy. Um, so these proxies, um, they're kind of things that run next to your code and they handle all the traffic to your code. And because they handle all the traffic, they do all the magic in these proxies. So proxy to me is the main thing in Istio that does all the work. And then everything else, the pilot and mixer and Istio auth, they kind of enable these proxies. But they're actually helpers for the proxy. Proxy is the thing that actually doing the work. So the proxy does HTTP 1.1, HTTP 2, gRPC, which is a binary protocol that's much more efficient than HTTP, uh, with or without TLS if you want. Um, the pilot um, kind of manages the proxies. So if you want to do some configuration changes, you would talk to the pilot as a user, and pilot will push those changes to the, to the proxies. So it's, it's a way of like, uh, managing your uh, proxies. Uh, Mixer is uh, for policy checks and telemetry. So every time your proxy wants to talk to the other proxy, it will first check with the mixer and say, can I talk to this proxy? Is there any limits I need to look out for? And the mixer will answer that question. Uh, so that's the policy check part. And also your proxies, they will keep track of some telemetries, right? Like how many requests have been made and, and stuff like that. So it will send that information to the mixer so mixer can aggregate it. So it's helping proxies to do checks and to keep track of tracing. And then Istio auth enables um, TLS. So if you want to set up service-to-service uh, -service authentication, Istio Hot uh, helps for that, and it pushes the configuration to the proxies. So as you can see, proxy is a thing, and the other things are just helping uh, for proxy to work correctly. Uh, so this proxy is called Envoy uh, as well, um, and we also call it Sidecar. So every time I say Envoy, proxy, Sidecar, I mean the same thing. Uh, it's written in C++, and as I mentioned, it does all the traffic um, between your microservices. 
and the pilots, I mean, I talked about this already. I just put them here in the slides so that you have them when you get the slides, so you have all these information, but I'm not gonna go through them all. Basically, the main point of pilot is that it tries to do si service discovery for the, uh, for the Envoy. Um, it does the traffic management capabilities, um, all the timers and retries, they go through the, the pilot. And it, it does the uh, conversion from configuration to the actual um, runtime. So if you want to configure something, you say it to pilot, and pilot tells to proxies to configure themselves. Um, also, pilot does another important thing. So as a user, you can talk to the pilot for the via the rules API. So you can tell pilot what you want. And then pilot converts that to different platforms. So if you are running on Kubernetes, it will take these rules, and it will apply that to Kubernetes. But if you're running on Mesos, it also has an adapter for Mesos, so it will change the rules to Mesos rules. Um, and it's very pluggable, as you can see. So if there's another platform that you want to support, you can write an adapter for it, and then Pilot will do the conversion for that platform. So that's important, the rules API to platform uh, conversion. Um, and also envoys, um, when they want to discover other envoys, it will go through the envoy API of the Pilot, and it will they will figure out who to talk to next. And then, yeah, I talked about this mixer already, but just to go through it bri briefly, um, it does precondition checking. So if your microservice wants to talk to another microservice, it will check with mixer, make sure that it can do that. Uh, quota management, so you can set quotas in um, Istio, and then th those quotas will be enforced by the mixer. And finally, telemetry reporting. So if you want to report telemetry, um, you can go uh, it will go to mixer, and mi mixer will aggregate them. And auth, Istio auth does mutual authentication between your proxies. So let me show you this. So let's say we want to deploy an application to our Istio cluster. Let's take a look at that. So yeah, I already have Kubernetes cluster and I already have Istio installed. And Istio comes with some sample applications. So here I'm doing kubectl create samples book info. This is an application that comes with Istio that I'm installing. And what you will see is that, and I'll pause here for a second. You see that this application has details microservice and details version one microservice and ratings microservice, um, re re reviews version one, version two, version three. So we have a bunch of microservices with different versions installed and we're gonna use these versions and do traffic splitting and stuff like that later. So it's basically a number of microservices with different kinds of versions installed by default. And then if we do kubectl get services, we see that we have detail service, product page, ratings, reviews. So this is for our book application. And then if you do get pods, we see that they are already running except one. This is still initializing. And then within a few seconds, it should initialize. So we have we have the app running already. Um, so for us to get to the app, first we need to get the get the ingress IP because ingress is how you get to your cluster through Istio. So the ingress ID I, IP is here. I'm gonna just set that IP to a gateway URL um, variable, and then we're gonna just take a look at that variable and just see how the application works. So what I'm doing here is I'm just curling that uh, product page. I get 200 but I can also take a look at the app itself. If I open a browser and go to slash um, product page, then I should see the application. And this is basically a, a simple page that has book details, book reviews. They're all talking to different microservices. And if I do refresh, you'll realize that these are updating. Uh, the reason why they're updating is that because I have different reviews, uh, microservices, and every time I do an update, it goes to a different microservice. And we're gonna fix that later. Um, yeah, so that's that's how we can install an application. So if you have your own application, you create a YAML file for it. Um, and, and then from there, you can just easily install it to um, Istio cluster like this. So once you have your Istio running, and once you have your application running, you can add some add-ons. Um, and these add-ons, um, there are some default ones like Grafana, Prometheus, Zipkin, that I'm gonna go through. But you can also add your own add-ons as well. If there's something custom that you want to add on, you can um, write, write the plugin for it and then add them on as well. Uh, so what is Grafana? Anyone using Grafana here? 
Yeah. Okay. So most of you know, it's basically a visualization tool, and you can just install it into your Istio cluster and see it working. Um, Prometheus for querying metrics. So we'll take a look at that. Zipkin is for tracing. So if you want to trace your HTTP calls, you can install Zipkin, and then you can see your product page, and then you can see what's happening underneath. Like wh wh what is it calling, and how long each call takes. And then service graph, this is kind of my favorite. This basically tells you your microservice graph. So you can see that we, we have ingress, that where the requests come in, then we have a product page, then we have reviews, and you can see their dependencies, and you can you also get some metrics, like how many requests per second that you, that you get uh, from that. There's a little bit flicker. I hope hopefully it's okay here. All right, so let, let's just take a look at how to install add-ons. So the under install folder, there's Kubernetes, and then under Kubernetes, there's add-ons. So I'm just installing Grafana now. So I just point to a YAML file for Grafana. Then I install Zipkin, same thing. So it's very simple. And I'll just keep going like this for Prometheus and Service Graph as well. And once these are installed, they are running on different ports. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do port forwarding from here to their port so that I can open it from my browser. So let's just first, I am um, first I want to, um, let's see, get pods, make sure that they are running. So if you look at the pods, you see that there's Grafana, there's uh, Prometheus, Service Graph, and I'm going to just send some traffic. So I'm just going to copy some command. Um, this will send some traffic to the product page, and with that traffic, we can look at the metrics and things like that. So now we are sending some traffic, and then I'm going to do like port forwarding from the Grafana or yeah, the Grafana port to 8080, so I can open it in my browser. And then let's take a look at it. So now we're taking a look at the, the dashboard uh, that you get by default with Grafana add-on. Uh, there's going to be an Istio dashboard. And then this will show you all the microservices in your cluster and then some metrics around them. So let's just take a quick look how that looks like. And things are populating and you can see that the requests are picking up because I'm sending requests. And then you see how many, what's your success rate. You see your HTTP codes, you see different versions of your microservices. So you get a nice graph by default. And the, the thing is you didn't change your code at all, right? It's because of the sidecars, all you get all these metrics and your code hasn't changed. And then for the other one, um, this is Prometheus. Oh, sorry, this is Zipkin, so this is for tracing. And in here, I can choose my product page and then find, find traces. And then this will show my product page and what the calls are being made from there. There you go. I have two more to show, but I'll skip because I only have five minutes left. I want to show you one more thing. Uh, so I'll just stop here. Let's close this. All right. And then lastly, um, I want to talk about traffic management. Um, so the good thing about Istio is that um, you can do dynamic request routing in Istio. So you can dynamically change uh, how traffic works in Istio. Um, and you can do things like fault injection. So you can actually add faults into your microservices and see how your microservices behave. Uh, for example, in, in this case, for uh, let's say service A wants to call service B. You can set, set up a rule in pilot and say, I want 99% of my service to go to this version, but I want 1% to go to that version. And when service A makes a call, it will just, it will just make a call to service B, like the, with this URL, but it won't know that behind the scenes, all these requests are going to here and 1% and are going here. So all this is done dynamically without you having to change the code. Similarly, you can do things like user agents. So you can say a user agent Android goes to this service, but then the ones from iPhone goes to that service and your service doesn't have to know about this. Uh, your service just works as it is, but Istio applies these rules. Um, and then you also get service discovery. So by default, Istio relies on the underlying platform for service discovery. So service A will just 
request the service B, and then Istio will figure out where it is through Kubernetes, and it will basically tell tell your service where the service B is. And there's failure recovery, but I have to skip because we are running out of time, but I want to show this. So you can also do fault injection. So let's say you have your front end talking to movies, and that's talking to stars, um, microservice. And let's say uh, you have these rules between these microservices. So you have a timeout of 100 milliseconds here with three read tries, and then you have a timeout of 200 milliseconds with two read tries. So you have different rules for different microservices. Um, you can actually add fault injection. So you can say you can actually make your microservices slow 300 milliseconds and test and see what happens. And then in this case, you can also set different rules. You can say 400 milliseconds and then see how your microservices behave. All right. I just want to show one last thing in the last two minutes I have. So as I mentioned, you can change routes dynamically in Kubernetes. So to do that, we'll, we'll just use Istio CTL command. It's a command you can use to change uh, traffic rules in Istio. Uh, let's play. So the, this is how you get the Istio CTL get route rules. This is how you get your rules. Today, we don't have any rules, so that's why these reviews are changing, because it's talking to the different versions of your reviews microservice. Let's say we want to pin this microservice to some version. To do that, we can just run Istio CTL, um, create F, and then samples, book info, and then point to a, a YAML file, route rule all v1 YAML. So this basically, what it, this does is this sets all your microservices to version one. So it sets them to all to a single version. And then if we look at the route rules now, we can see that they're all set to version one. So we just change our routing rule now. And if you go and refresh, we'll see that this doesn't change anymore because we set it to version one. So we you can do that dynamically. Um, and then the last thing, very last thing, promise, <laughs> that I'm going to show you is let's say you want to apply a rule to a certain user, right? Just for that user, you can do that with uh, Istio. So in here, I'm going to do Istio CTL create dash F samples and point to another YAML file, which will pin a certain user to a certain microservice. So if you want to test certain users with certain microservices, you can do that. So in this case, we are pinning a user. Um, let's see who this user is, Jason. We are pinning Jason to version two of our microservice. So this is our microservice here. We refresh, and now JSON is pinned to this microservice. No matter how, much, how many times we update, JSON will always be pinned to that one. And if you want to get rid of it, you can just say delete, and then this will get rid of all the routing rules. So that's how you can change things dynamically in Istio. I wish I could tell you more, but I'm running out of time. And cleanup is very easy. You just run a command, and it gets rid of Istio um, from your cluster. And you can just still use your cluster as if Istio never existed. I had a demo on this, but I don't have time. I can show you after the talk if you want. Yeah, so that's all I had. Thanks very much for listening. If you want the slides, that's my Twitter. And I don't know, do we have time for questions?